Hi, everybody. Um, we are ready to get started now. Welcome to an introduction to environmental um, DNA monitoring for amphibians and reptiles, otherwise known as eDNA. I'm Jen Williams, the National Federal Coordinator for Partners in the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. I'm going to go over a couple of logistical items really quickly before we start the webinar. Um, if you're interested in asking any questions, please type them into the questions box and not the chat box. We like for folks to use the questions box because we can then export um, all of the questions after the webinar. And so if there are any that we didn't get to during the webinar, we're, we'll happy, um, we're happy to answer them afterwards, either through email or we'll notify you of another upcoming webinar that will answer your questions. Um, we are recording today, and this webinar will be posted to the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation um, website, and that is at parkplace.org, P-A-R-C-P-L-A-C-E dot O-R-G, and I'll put that um, website in the chat box. So a little bit about the speaker. Steve Spear is the Director of Wildlife Ecology at the Wilds in Cumberland, Ohio. Prior to his current position, Steve worked as a conservation scientist for the Orient Society for almost nine years. He received his PhD in 2009 from Washington State University. He has an MS degree from Idaho State University and his BS is from University of Richmond. His work focuses on the ecology and conservation of wildlife species with a special emphasis on combining genetic techniques with field ecology. So thanks to everybody for listening in and take it away, Steve. All right, um, thanks, Jen, and, and thanks to everyone for joining in. And uh, I'm excited to talk for the next uh, 40 minutes or so about eDNA. And um, my goal with this webinar is really, it's the, the main audience is geared toward folks that um, don't know much about eDNA or have heard a little about it or maybe read some papers and are interested in getting involved but don't know the entire process or have lots of questions about how it works when you're trying to use it for, for survey and monitoring and, and those sorts of questions. Um, I'm not planning to go into super in-depth into any one topic um, just because it would be, you know, I could talk literally all day about that. Um, so I'm trying to cover a lot um, at minimum depth, but I do want to leave time at the end for questions, and that way, um, you know, folks can can tailor what, what their questions are. Um, and, and obviously, as the title indicates, I'm focusing on um, reptiles and amphibians, but the methods could be applied to any tax, but just the examples that I'm given are primarily from, from reptiles and amphibians. Let's see. Okay, so the first question is, what is environmental DNA or, or eDNA we use for short. And with, with what I'm going to talk about, there's we we're thinking about it more in a more specific way, but just environmental DNA in general is really any situation where you're being able to collect DNA, extract DNA from a source that doesn't come from having to have your hands directly on um, that animal or plant or or whatever you're looking at. Um, so eDNA from that broad definition has been in place for, or people have been doing those sorts of studies um, for for a number of years now, um, and that includes things like scat, uh, hair, scat and hair are probably two of the most common things that um, were pioneered really in the 90s and in, in, into the 2000s, and then other things like eggshells, um, shed skin from snakes, feathers, et cetera. So there's a whole host of sources of eDNA, um, broadly speaking, uh, that, that don't involve putting your hands on the animal. However, all of these examples I'm showing here uh, still require you to find some sign of that animal. So even though you're not having to catch that bear or, or cougar or whatever and sample it, you still have to you know, put out a snare for it to go by or to look for its scat. Um, and, and so it's still a bit of a scavenger hunt. What most folks these days when they talk about eDNA, um, they're referring more specifically to what I call aquatic eDNA. So getting DNA from the environment of water. Uh, hey, Steve. And, and, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you hear me um, okay? I, uh, everybody's saying that they don't have any audio. Um, I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, we started the broadcast and I don't know what is going on. I mean, obviously you can hear me okay, so it's not my phone, huh? 
Okay, you know what? Some people can hear and some people don't. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt the um, the webinar. Let's let's just go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully hopefully other folks can figure it out and, and hopefully my volume's okay and everything. Um, yeah, it sounds great. I'll just say real quick um, to everybody. Well, I guess not the people who can't hear can't hear. Let me just um, put something in the chat box. Sorry about that, Steve. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, so. Aquatic eDNA is really taking getting eDNA from 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 water, and that is a bit of a game changer because you don't I mean, you have to go to the water source, but you don't have to hunt down for any specific um, sign from that animal, for instance. And really, the proof of concept study for what we do now with aquatic eDNA for for vertebrates or multicellular organisms was a study back in uh, 2008 um, by Fistatola et al. in France, looking at what there is invasive bullfrogs. And what they did was they collected a small amount of water from ponds that they knew had lots of bullfrogs from surveys, um, sites where they, they knew bullfrogs were there, but at low density, again, based on previous survey data, and sites where they, the best uh, survey efforts indicated no bullfrogs. Um, and what, what this table is showing is uh, they then extracted DNA from that, extracted DNA from that water um, and amplified it specifically for bullfrogs. And so this is showing the percentage of samples that showed positive for bullfrogs. And what they found was that if you have high bullfrog densities, almost all the time, you get a positive signal of, of bullfrog DNA. The ones that had low density, and what this meant by low density is like one to two bullfrogs, you still, not as much, but you still consistently picked up bullfrog DNA. And encouragingly, the spots where they were pretty sure there were bullfrogs, they weren't getting false positives, it, it was zero. So this was really the first paper that that generated the field of aquatic eDNA for things like herps um, and spurred a whole lot of studies and showed that it could work without having to, to sample a ton of water. And so now, you know, with a cup of water, uh, you can you can potentially detect all sorts of members of the aquatic community. So, you know, things that are semi-aquatic like water snakes to, to things like hellbenders, crayfish, trout. Um, I don't have it up here, but even things like deer, if they're drinking from a water source and their saliva is going in the water, you could potentially pick them up. Um, and so it's it's become a, a pretty powerful survey method for detecting presence, as I'll I'll talk about further. I'm also going to mention just a little bit. I'm not anywhere near as much depth because the studies on this is is really in its infancy. Uh, but it, it's something that a lot of people ask about, and, and for good reason, particularly with herps, which tend to spend a lot of time underground is getting eDNA not from water, but from soil or sediment. Uh, and this slide is, is showing that yes, at least in some cases, it, it's possible. This was one of the first studies, again, looking at, at vertebrates, um, terrestrial vertebrates getting soil eDNA. And this was from a game park in Europe. Um, so elephants, tigers, ostriches. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but basically the black areas represent where they picked up DNA from, from those animals. So uh, I'll talk about this more in a hurt context later in the talk, um, but that, that's another emerging direction for eDNA that, that doesn't directly involve water. So I'm gonna transition into some of the, the specific methods of how we actually um, collect and amplify eDNA, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the case studies. Um, so there's, the specific methods can vary based on the study in different labs, have come up with different specific ways of collecting, extracting, and amplifying DNA. So I, this is by no means an exhaustive review of every method, but these are some of the, the common ways and, and certainly what, what I do in my lab. Um, in general, uh, the, the two main ways are either taking a small water sample and centrifuging it so that anything in that water sample goes down to the bottom, and then you can extract from that, from that precipitate, which would have all the cells and DNA. Um, so this is actually the initial bullfrog paper I talked about. This is what they did. They used 15 milliliters of water for that. Um, I know uh, Fish and Wildlife Service do that a lot um, with some of their eDNA sampling. Um, it does require having some of the right equipment, like you need uh, a, a centrifuge that can handle at least 50 mil tubes, um, which is not in, in every lab, in fact, not in my lab. But it, it's a way that, that's been effective when it's been tried. Um, the other way that, that's probably more common uh, is filtering the water. And so you, um, you run some amount of, of water through a filter 
and then you actually extract off of that filter. And that's typically what I do with eDNA samples that I collect. Uh, there's several, there's a number of papers that have looked at what filter types are best, what pore size is best, and it, to a large degree, it depends on the exact study and what organisms you're trying to isolate from. Uh, the range of pore sizes for the filters range from 0.2 to 5 uh, microns. Uh, I tend to use 0.45, but there's there's certainly been um, uh, good examples of of larger pores that have worked. Um, that can be really helpful, particularly if you have turbid water where these filters get clogged up very easily. Um, as I mentioned, the centrifuging water a common amount is 15 mils. You could go a little higher than that, but you can't do too much water when you're centrifuging it down. Um, again, it depends on the study and how turbid your water is and uh, what you're trying to detect. But the range for the amount of water that typically gets filtered is 250 milliliters all the way up to 10 liters um, for, for some studies. Uh, when you have really nice, clear river water, you can get multiple liters. Uh, in more realistic cases, uh, it, it tends to be more 250 milliliters to a water, or to a liter, excuse me. And if you're dealing with really turbid water, sometimes getting 250 milliliters to go through one of these filters is a, is a real struggle. Um, but that that's kind of the, the, the general range. This photo here kind of basically shows the basic requirements, at least for the filtration method. Um, you can do it as simply with, with a hand pump that you can buy from any auto parts store or Amazon. Um, and you hook it up in a flask, and over here are a stack of filters that you put on top. Um, I'll show some more pictures a little bit later. Um, but in, in a sense, it's, it's pretty simple to collect this water. Um, it's simple, but uh, the most critical thing is not necessarily the actual equipment, but making sure that equipment is clean and you're not um, transferring DNA from one sample to another. Because eDNA is very much low copy uh, DNA procedure. It means that even at its best, there's not going to be much there. So if you inadvertently spread DNA from some other source into your sample, it's going to it's going to probably form a large part of what's in there and, and easily contaminate your sample. Um, so we have a number of quality assurance, quality control protocols that are essential if you're both collecting and running eDNA um, that every study should should keep in mind and, and follow. Um, if you're using a lot of equipment to collect your water, like let's say you have to go out in a boat um, or use nets, uh, buckets, make sure in between every site um, or depending on, on your study questions, even every sample, that you thoroughly decontaminate um, with, uh, with, with bleach or something else that degrades DNA, your equipment between, between sites, um, if, if it's a problem that it, if you spread it. Now, if you're taking multiple samples within the same river and you don't really care, um, because you're trying to, to have those samples represent the river as a whole, then it's not like you need to, to clean all your stuff in between each sample, but certainly when you're moving between sites. Um, so I mentioned bleach is a, is, is a common uh, way to, to clean gear. Um, DNA away is another one that, that I use a lot, particularly for forceps, um, which we use to, to move the filter into a tube, which I'll show in a moment. Um, DNA away is if you were using large quantities like we typically do with bleach, would get really expensive, but it's definitely effective. Um, and then there's other disinfectants like Vircon Aquatic that, that one could use. Um, but it's important is something that will degrade um, DNA. So there's, as far as collecting your water, and I'm focusing mostly on filtration here. Um, for the centrifuge method, obviously you're collecting the water in some container, but then it then you're moving to, to the centrifuge. Um, but if you're filtering it, you can do it in one of two ways. Um, this, this picture you can see on the, on the left here that my, my mouse is over is showing actually filtering at the site. In this case, instead of a hand pump, they're using a motor, um, which you, you can certainly do. It makes, it makes things a lot faster. Um, but you can, you can see he's, he's collecting the water in the cup uh, right by the stream um, and then running it through right there. You'll also notice that uh, in both these pictures, um, they're taking care to not get into the stream. And if it's possible for your study question to sample from the banks, that's certainly preferable because then you're less worried about um, moving DNA between your equipment. Although sometimes certainly you may need to get deeper into there. Um, so, that's, so that's when you're sampling at the site. Uh, if you're sampling, say, in a lab, which I'll show in a second, um, you can take a clean bottle, obviously either one that hasn't been used before or that's been thoroughly disinfected, and collect your, your water source. And you can see everybody's wearing gloves. Um, that's also part of the, the protocol that, that you want to use. 
um, and, and obviously change gloves between sites. Another really important aspect is having um, negative controls at multiple stages, but starting in the field. So field blanks of deionized water or some water source that you are 100% confident would not contain DNA from your target species um, need to be run through using the same filtration system as you do your unknown samples. Uh, this is a way to make sure that the way you collect your samples and the way you run through your samples um, aren't introducing contamination on their own. Uh, the general rule of thumb is about 10% of your total unknown samples. It'd be good to have field blanks. Um, obviously, you can adapt this to, to your study system, uh, particularly if you've run a lot of samples and you get a pretty good idea of, of what your error rate may be. Uh, for instance, I would recommend if you're just starting an eDNA study, um, doing, doing a field blank for every site you sample. So let's say you take three replicates at a site, um, taking a, a field blank with that, even though that's more than 10%, uh, it, to make sure that your protocols are, 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 are uh, staying clean and you're not contaminating. Then as you run a lot of samples, if you show, okay, you know, I'm, my, my negatives are always clean, um, then you can reduce the percentage, say, to that 10%. Uh, so it's up to your judgment, but realize that if you get a field blank that does show a positive, anything that you've run before that field blank, you have to basically consider contamination. So you could lose a lot of samples um, if you do it too infrequently and, and you have contamination. So I mentioned you can collect the water and bring it into the lab. So here's an example. It's basically the same setup, just a little bit more comfortable, I guess. Um, this is, is the, the motor is not in view of this picture, but uh, this is uh, using a motor to run it through. And again, you pour the, pour the water in the cup. At the bottom of that cup is a filter and it runs through. And you can see that's at the bottom, um, that's the filter. And, and it's collected some of the, the sediment that's in the water. In this case, this isn't too bad. It's not too clogged up, um, but they, they can get really clogged and it can be difficult to filter through. Uh, it, so I, I will say that this, what's wrong with this photo is that we took this just as a demonstration and forgot to put gloves on. Uh, you should be wearing gloves when you're doing this. So that's, that's uh, uh, my mistake, but that's essentially once, the, once you've filtered your water, um, use forceps to pull the filter um, out of the bottom casing. You can see this blue thing here. This is where the cup was sitting on and then the filter was sitting there. Um, and then you fold it up and, and put it into the tube. Um, and uh, then in the tube, what we have here is 95% ethanol, which is a good storage uh, medium for, uh, especially if you're in the field and you can't get into a freezer right away. Although if you're going to extract from the filter immediately, you don't have to put in ethanol first. You can just move it directly into the extraction process, or maybe even put it into lysis buffer, um, depending on your exact extraction protocol. See? Once you're in the lab um, and you've, you've filtered your water or you've centrifuged your water and you're ready to go, um, again, uh, QAQC is so critical in working with these samples. It's so easy to contaminate with other DNA if you're not careful. Um, and so I highly recommend that all extraction, DNA extraction and PCR setup, all the lab work that you do um, to set up these samples is done in a clean room. And what I mean by a clean room or a clean lab um, is an area where there is no PCR product or you've never brought any of your, any animals in that you're working with, um, or there's, there's no uh, samples that come from really high quality tissue where there might be um, a lot of DNA there. You're basically keeping out anything that might contaminate your samples of the same DNA source. Ideally, you have something like a laminar flow hood to work out of. That's not critical if everything else is followed, but it, it really helps out. Um, you, it's, this is really important. You never, ever want to do eDNA in a lab space where you've worked with either the animals themselves or lots of DNA or have thermocyclers for running PCR in that lab because it's just way too easy to contaminate. Um, there's a number of different ways uh, you can extract DNA from filters or from the centrifuge samples, uh, but it typically just follows slight modifications of standard methods. So um, if you're familiar with different DNA extraction techniques like the Kyogen um, DNEasy kit, uh, that's what I tend to use, a modified protocol of that. Um, but you can also use um, other methods as well, like phenol chloroform is a, is, a, is a pretty common DNA extraction method that folks use. Um, so it, Usually use a little bit of modification, but it, it, it's not anything too drastically different than any other type of DNA extraction. In my case, I tend to, with the filters, um, tear them in half. 
so I have a, a backup in case something goes wrong with the first extraction. Um, dry them. If you, if you do store them in ethanol, it's really important that the ethanol dry off before you continue with the extraction process, but then go through the kit protocol with, with some uh, modifications. And, and all, of course, all these details are in, in some of the published papers that have done this. I mentioned field blanks. Um, you also want lab blanks, so lab negatives. So these are samples that you treat the same and have all the same reagents as your, your, uh, your unknown samples. But that you just don't put any anything in there, or you know, a, a blank filter or something like that. So uh, again, it's a way to make sure that you don't have contamination in your lab environment. Uh, and this is good practice for any sort of genetic work, but it's especially critical for eDNA. So I'm going to transition to once you've extracted the DNA um, and you're figuring out, okay, well, I presumably have DNA extracted from from my source. How do I actually see if it contains DNA from my species or species of or, or multiple species of interest? And there's three kind of broad ways that that folks have um, have detected uh, DNA of species. One is just kind of using traditional um, PCR presence absence. So if you're not familiar with PCR, it stands for polymerase chain reaction. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a way that we can artificially replicate DNA in the lab. And so we can make lots and lots of DNA from a particular fragment. Um, and we define that fragment, that amount of DNA that we're replicating by what are called primers. And primers are basically the bookends for that sequence. And uh, it's, it's what directs the, the PCR process that you're only getting, or at least ideally, only getting fragments between those two primers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about primers in a moment. So one is just running a, a, a standard PCR and you can run it on agros gel and see do you get do you get those fragments or not. If you do, it means it's it suggests it's positive. If not, it suggests it's negative. Um, middle is quantitative PCR, which is um, a really uh, common now way of of looking for a particular species. It's again using the PCR process, except you have um, an additional probe component that I'll talk a little bit more in a moment, where you can actually quantify the amount of DNA that's in there. So you can not only get presence absence, but how much is there. And then finally, um, metabarcode sequencing. So this is, you're actually um, sequencing the DNA within, um, uh, within your sample. And this is commonly used to, to identify multiple species within a sample of a community. Uh, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about, about these specifically. So for the PCR presence absence, this requires species-specific primers. So what it means is these are the, the sequences that book in your fragment of interest that match up with whatever species you're interested in um, and, and don't match up with species that you're not. So you, you have to know what you're targeting. You're not going to use this sort of PCR presence absence for trying to uh, get all of the species within your water sample. Um, it, it's very inexpensive to run. Uh, I mean, you could... If you're, all you're doing is running a PCR and, and then running it on agarose gel, which is pretty common equipment to most labs, I mean, you can, you can do it for, for a few dollars per sample. It, it's, it's, it's not very much. Um, you could potentially multiplex it if you, have, if you use fluorescent primers and then run it on a sequencer using fragment analysis like you would microsatellites, uh, but you wouldn't multiplex if you were just doing a, an agarose gel. And that adds a little bit to the cost, but it's still relatively relatively cheap. And when I'm when I'm throwing out some of these cost generalities, I'm not including things like labor. I'm just talking about supply cost. Uh, so this is really a, a definitely a good way if you're just getting into a system and and want to investigate how things how things are working. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have as much information as some of the other methods, as we'll talk about. So qPCR, um, quantitative PCR, is also a species specific method. Um, so again, you have to design primers that, that fit to whatever species you're targeting. It's not going to get the whole community. Uh, in, in what qPCR adds, um, well, number one, you have different equipment to run it on. Um, the previous one, a, a standard thermocycler will work. Uh, the qPCR has a special machine that, that's made to, um, a special cycler that, that's made to pick up the, these fluorescent probes. And what the fluorescent probe does is it's a short sequence in the middle of your fragment that you're trying to amplify, and every time your DNA is replicating in the PCR, that, that probe fluoresces. And so the sensors on the, on the machine will pick that up, and if it's not amplifying, if it's not replicating, it won't fluoresce. So it'll just be, like if you can see at the very beginning before uh, on this graph, before you have any amount of 
DNA replication that is sensitive that the, the machine can pick up, you see it's a flat line. And if that flat line continued across the entire graph, that would be a negative. There's no fluorescence that can be picked up. But as you start to get enough amplification, enough replication that the machine can pick it up, you start to see an increase in fluorescence, which is essentially what this line is, is picking up. And this tells us, and this is a really standard, you have this exponential increase and then it plateaus off. Um, this is telling us that this is a positive sample. And if we have standard curves, so if we have standard samples that we know the amount of DNA is in, we can extrapolate how much DNA is in our unknown samples. Uh, we can easily multiplex at least two to three species, depending on your, um, your real-time machine, maybe more, um, by giving them different fluorescent colors on their probes. Uh, and this, this is a really common way that a lot of folks, including myself, are, are, uh, are amplifying eDNA, particularly if we're focusing on species or a small group of species. Um, so I've mentioned, the, I've talked a bit about species-specific primers. Just to, just to emphasize, this is a really, really important aspect if you're trying to identify a particular species because, as you probably can tell, neither of the previous methods are you sequencing anything. So you don't, you have to trust, um, you have to be confident that when you see a positive band or that amplification, that it's only amplifying the species you're interested in. And the way you gain that confidence is by first designing those primers so that the, the two bookends match up um, perfectly or at least very nearly perfectly with DNA from your target species. So this requires that you have sequences from whatever you're interested in to begin with. And, and there's a lot of, particularly for North America, there's a lot of sequence data already on the web. So this doesn't mean you have to go out and get your own sequence data usually, um, especially for North America. And it needs to have multiple mismatches of nucleotides with other species that might be out there. Um, so it doesn't bind with those and it doesn't replicate those, those species. And so you can look um, on the computer to, to design primers that, based on sequence data that look like that, that should fit that. Um, then you can, so you test that in silico on the computer to say, okay, it looks like this shouldn't, um, this shouldn't amplify uh, the other species. So if I'm interested in spotted salamanders, if I design it right, it shouldn't amplify Jefferson salamanders or wood frogs or whatever. Um, of course, then you need to actually test it more than just on the computer. So testing in vitro would mean that you would get um, DNA samples from these different species and run your protocol with those DNA samples and make sure that it doesn't amplify them. If it does amplify them, then you need to go back to the drawing board um, to make sure that, that ultimately the, the one that you deploy on unknown samples, you have as confident as you can get with these trials that it's only going to amplify your species of interest. Now, you don't have to worry about that with metabarcode sequencing because you're trying to um, amplify uh, a large number of species within a community. And that community is defined by the primers that you use. So you're still using these primers, these bookends of the fragment you're trying to amplify. But in this case, for, for multiple species, they're cons what's called conserved primers. So they're ones that are going to match up, or at least be closely matched enough to, to, uh, to bind to a whole host of species. So say you're trying to amplify all amphibians. Um, you can design uh, primers that uh, match up with most amphibians, but then are variable from, say, fish or invertebrates or whatever. Um, so you're going to get more species, but you still have to do that primer design. Uh, for this, we're using next generation sequencing platforms um, where you can, especially with, with uh, barcodes, you can um, put on unique barcodes on these different samples, and you'll actually, you can run a lot of, a lot of different samples and for a lot of different uh, 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 species at once. And so this graph here is just showing the number of sequences, which is also called the number of reads. And the, the colors aren't important. They represent different species. But you can see multiple colors, which means that, and these are all different sites from, from this particular study, um, that they picked up uh, multiple species. Although in this case, whatever the purple species is, you can see it is really dominant. So this is a, a really good, good platform to, to use if you're interested in the community. Um, I should mention people are interested in costs for the qPCR, which I just talked about, the species specific one. Again, supplies only, generally, at least like the protocols that I use, um, $15 to $20 a sample for the reagents to run those, um, again, not including things like labor or overhead. Um, Metabarcoding is, is certainly more expensive than that, and really is, but it's, it's becoming much cheaper, and particularly if you're running um, a lot of samples 
at once or you're working with other labs that are, are, are running samples at the same time because on these next gen platforms, you can run a lot of different multiplex, a lot of samples at once. And so a, a, a next generation sequencing run on its own is several thousand dollars, but if you're running a lot of samples or sharing it with other folks, the cost per sample can go down quite a bit. So that's really variable just depending on the situation in which you're, you're running them. Um, so that's, and I know very quickly in a nutshell, how we actually get a species ID um, and in some cases, the amount of DNA from um, from a sample. So the rest of the time, I'm gonna what I'm calling frequently asked questions. So these are a lot of these are based on questions that were forwarded to me by Jen that she had heard from other folks or things that I've gotten just from talking to people. Um, I'm having case studies kind of mixed in into the answers to these questions. And what I'm hoping again that we'll have a little bit of time um, that you can ask your specific questions um, about either the methodology or what I touch on now. Hey, so the Steve. first obvious question. Steve, yeah, go ahead. Would it be okay if we went through some questions that people had specifically about the content you just covered really quickly? Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, and I apologize if um, you did answer the question after they asked it. I've been um, navigating the questions as they're coming in and so haven't been able to devote my full attention to the presentation. But the first question is, what do you mean by a field blank? Um, sure, that's a good question. Um, so a field blank is, is as I mentioned, some kind of clean water. So ideally deionized water, but if you can't get deionized water, uh, some water source where you're absolutely sure your, your target species wouldn't be in. And you would um, say you're, like, let's say you're filtering in the field. Uh, maybe you have a, a large bottle of your deionized water. You would bring with you out in the field. Um, you filter, say, three samples from a, from a river. And then right after, either right before or right after, um, depending on how you're doing it, you would then pour your, your clean water through that same filtering apparatus and then save that filter just like you were going to try and analyze as an unknown sample. And that way you know if in between your, your samplings, in between sites with your equipment, if you're getting, um, if you're getting contamination. Because if your field blank when you just poured in the DI water um, shows up positive, then you know there's a problem. Um, and there's, there's different ways uh, of doing it. Like, let's say you're bringing things from the, the field back into the lab. Um, you may want to still fill up, you know, take your bottle out in the field, maybe even roll it around. Like with, if you're storing all your samples in a cooler, store it in the same cooler. So if, if there's contamination that's occurring between samples on the way back to the lab, you're picking that up too. But it's anything that the only difference between how you're collecting in the field is that it's water without, that you know doesn't have any target DNA in it. Okay, thank you. And then the next question is, why does the filter have to be dried? Um, if you're using ethanol, it has to be dried because ethanol will interfere with the extraction protocol um, from from the get go. Uh, at least the at least the the one that I use. So um, you, that that's the only reason. Um, it, it's not that it, it's not that it has. If it's like wet from water, obviously that's fine. It just has to be dried if you store it in ethanol. Okay. Um, and it says, Steve mentioned that you store the filters in 95% ethanol. Can you also store them in a minus 80 freezer until you're ready to extract? Absolutely. Yeah. So I was, with that, it was more of like if you're in the field without easy access. But yeah, the, the best way is to, if you have access to it, is to get it right into a freezer. And so if you're, if you're filtering in the lab, particularly, um, and so, you know, you put the, filter in a tube and then you can turn around and put in the minus 80. Um, you don't need to put in ethanol or, or anything else there. You can just put it right in the minus 80. Um, but obviously if you're in the field, that's, that's not um, a possibility. You certainly don't want to just put the filter in the field, put the filter alone in a tube and then, you know, put in the minus 80 two days later or whatever. But yeah, definitely freezing would work. And in fact, when you're out of the field, even when it's in something like ethanol, um, you don't have to put in a minus 80, but I always put mine in a freezer because that, again, is just going to help be a safeguard for things not breaking down. Okay. And do you need a clean room if you have a flow hood, or do you need a clean room with a flow hood, like both together? Ideally, both together. Um, I would be, I mean, a, a flow hood on its own is, is 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 certainly better than nothing. I would still be pretty nervous if I had a, a lab where I was running PCR product or I had the, you know, tanks with the species of interest. 
and I was just assuming the lamellar flow hood would kind of take care of things. I mean, I, I it, it would make me nervous, I suppose, you know, if you were very, very vigilant about you being the, the hood and all sorts of, but I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> you certainly, I mean, if you're ever in a situation like that, where you, you want to try these samples and you, you think that you, you think it's not ideal, but you think it might work, like make sure you just include tons of controls. But like I said, I'd, I'd feel very uncomfortable um, working in a, in a lab that had a lot of PCR product of my species of interest, even if there was a hood in that, that same room. Okay. And it says, Steve mentioned that the filters could be stored in ethanol when a freezer wasn't available. Would a conventional freezer work or is a minus 80 necessary? Yeah, when you, for the filters that are in ethanol, a conventional freezer is, is typically fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would say that that would be fine for, for that stage. Okay. It says, do species-specific primers only target mitochondrial DNA, or do nu nuclear primers exist or work? We've been having trouble with mitochondrial introgression between two of our species. Yeah, that's a good question. One thing I didn't really talk about, um, the, the source of DNA. Uh, in, in theory, yeah, species-specific should be able to work with any um, any type of DNA, and mitochondrial is by far the most common for eDNA, and, and the major reason for that is that we have a lot more mitochondrial DNA in our cells than we have nuclear, because we just have one nucleus and a lot of mitochondria. Um, and so when we're dealing with, you know, low copy samples, it's just easier to amplify mitochondrial per se. Um, but, and so if you, if you can, um, so it probably is going to take more optimization to get nuclear markers to work, just because there's less nuclear DNA. But um, there's no reason, in theory, it can't um, if you can if if you can get those uh, nuclear markers to amplify. Okay, and we have tons of other questions flowing in, but maybe this um, next section that you have on FAQs will get to them, and and then whatever we can't cover, we'll um, hopefully get to folks later. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so the first question is, of course, does it work? And I mean, you probably figure. Um, it does if we're doing this webinar, but I just, uh, and this is off the top of my head, so there's very possible um, a, a Herp family that I left off that I just either forgot about or haven't seen the paper yet. But this is just a list of, of different families of Herps and in a couple of cases, a couple of diseases that, um, that affect amphibians that, uh, that at least one member of that family has, has been used successfully in eDNA studies. So, Lots of amphibian, both frog and salamander um, uh, groups. Uh, is it chytrid and ronavirus? Um, uh, a few tur different turtles, particularly the ones that are semi-aquatic. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about soil. And there's been some uh, a recent study that was a snake example for cluberids and pythons. So um, it it works across a, a lot of, of different species um, that are broad ecologies. Now some of these are easier, more easy than others, um, and you may have different protocols as far as sampling, but it, it's been shown to work pretty broadly in a lot of different herb species. So the follow-up question is, okay, you can get it to work, but is it reliable and efficient? And so there's kind of three sub-questions within that. Is there high detection probability? So if you go out and sample water, how often are you gonna get a positive if they're actually there? Um, and kind of related to that, is it effective compared to other methods? So yeah, maybe we can get it to work, but if we go out and dip net, are we going to have an easier time to get the same answer? And then, of course, you know, how much are false positives a big deal? Are we, you know, are we going to get positives that 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 actually aren't true? So I'm going to break down these three um, with a little bit of data. So detection probability, detection probability, for instance, if you're, if you're familiar with occupancy modeling, is a key parameter in that. Um, and so I'm just going to show a couple of, of studies that I've been involved with that, that get at this. So this first one, this is a Hellbender study by, um, that was done by a, a master's student at Appalachian State, uh, Tommy Franklin, um, that, that I helped out with. And don't worry too much about all the graphs, but what the top part of this graph shows eDNA surveys, and the bottom part shows traditional surveys, which in this case was rock flipping and snorkeling for Hellbenders. What I want to, to point out is that at low concentrations of eDNA, we get close to um, close to 100% detection. And in fact, the overall detection rate um, for eDNA was was 0.9 in the system. So really high. 
Um, it actually was also fairly high with the rock flipping surveys, but it's a lot less effort to collect eDNA for hellbenders than in, in, in less habitat disturbance. Um, even bigger difference is this is an example by a study by Todd Pearson um, with uh, a very small plethodontid salamander, Ursplerpes brucei, the patch note salamander, um, where he did both eDNA and leaf litter bags in the streams. This is a, a, um, an aquatic breeding plethodontid, um, headwater streams. And he found, again, um, this is showing pretty high detection probability for eDNA and much lower for litter, ba litter bags. And you basically, for two eDNA samples, um, that level 95% detection probability, you need to have 62 nights of litter bag surveys. Um, so it's showing that high detection, and also in this case, compared to the common survey method for the species, uh, much more effective. Similarly, with the bullfrog system that I mentioned from the get-go, this, this is also in France, um, this, uh, this figure shows um, on the left are surveys that were done um, traditional, I forget exactly, I think like DIPNET maybe calling surveys for bullfrogs, but traditional field surveys. On the right, in the, in the, the black indicates positive, the, the white indicates negative. On the right is eDNA. Um, and you can see uh, that there are a lot more uh, black circles with eDNA. So again, in this system, um, eDNA was, was a lot more effective. This is not to say that in every single uh, eDNA example that this is the case. And there, there are some examples where it's just particularly where field methods are relatively easy to implement um, and, and pretty effective, or it's just a highly detectable species, maybe one that calls a whole lot. Like, I, I probably would never bother doing eDNA for spring peepers, for instance. Um, uh, so it's, it's not always more effective, but I think there's a lot of studies that show that, that it can be uh, more effective than field surveys. Of course, you're not getting your hands on the organism, so you're, you, there's a lot of information that you don't have. So I, I see it as complementary to field surveys, even when it has a higher detection probability rather than a replacement. Um, and then false positives, obviously it's, um, false positives are a little bit hard to um, definitively demonstrate without real controlled systems or controlled studies. Uh, false positives don't seem to be, uh, at least in, in my work with eDNA and, and looking at different papers, I think in general, false positives are not prevalent in these studies. There's not a lot of examples of, of uh, places where you know for a lot of survey work that they're not there and that, then you get them. But there are a lot of examples of areas with limited survey work where you get a lot more eDNA positives than, um, than survey positives. And so that does speak to the fear that, well, what if some of those are false positives? Uh, the best way to, to, to try and detect that if it actually is happening is, of course, the negative controls. Um, so if you're, if you're getting a lot of positives um, in your field samples, but you're also getting positives in your DI controls, well, yeah, that's probably false positives. Um, doing a lot of PCR replicates. So I typically, like for quantitative PCR, I'll typically run them in triplicates. So for each sample, I'll run them three times. And so if I just get one out of those three showing positive, I'll typically rerun them again to make sure I get consistently at least one out of three showing up. And sometimes you can get one out of three just if it's very low concentration, that's, that's all you can get. But if I, if I get one out of three and then I run a couple more times and I'm getting zero out of three on those, those following ones, then I'm less likely to consider that, consider that a positive. So PCR replicates can help with that. If you, you're always getting it popping up um, and your negative controls are, are negative, then you have, I think, more, more confidence that it's not a false positive. And also spatial replicates within a site. So taking multiple, or I guess maybe I should say site replicates, taking multiple samples within the same site. And if you take a bunch and only one replicate pops up as positive, then that might be a false positive. So those are ways to try and, you can never like obviously completely eliminate any chance of it, but those are uh, ways to try and um, to, to address it or limit it. So can you get eDNA from soil? Um, so a lot of questions I have, including myself as someone who, who also works on snakes, who's, who's wondered about that. Um, and there had been, I showed that, that study with the, the game park. Um, there had been some work showing carp eDNA from sediment of rivers. Uh, but with herps, um, the, there's a study that came out this year by Kucherenko et al. Um, of South Florida. And uh, they were looking at, um, they did a, a, a lab test with, with corn snakes and then looked in the field for gopher tortoise burrows where based on telemetry, they knew Burmese pythons were or they knew that they weren't based on telemetry. Um, 
and, and seeing if they could pick up Burmese pythons um, and in, in the lab, corn snakes. And they found that in, in, the, uh, in the lab setting, they could detect DNA from corn snakes. And this figure is showing with the Burmese python. So they took samples at the apron of the tortoise burrow and then down inside. Um, and what they found, what this is showing in a nutshell, is based on their telemetry work, um, and they were just using presence absence of PCR. They didn't find them anywhere on the aprons, um, but at sites where they knew pythons had gone into, uh, based on telemetry, they actually detected eDNA successfully inside the burrow. Um, and they did not detect any eDNA in burrows that they had no evidence that pythons were using. This is really cool, and um, I think the first, at least published, example for things like reptiles um, that we can potentially use soil um, to, to detect their presence. So do I need my own lab? Obviously, having your own lab helps a lot, um, and everything I've talked about so far is predicated on either having your own lab or working with a lab. But what's interesting is that there is some technology out there where you can run your own eDNA now, and you don't need your own lab. And so this is um, companies Biomem and Smith Root have developed a, a uh, portable eDNA system that uh, includes both a extraction um, kit that can be done in the field, takes five minutes um, from a filter sample, and a handheld quantitative PCR unit. So you can run qPCR in the field. Um, and I actually got to do a uh, test of this um, with the Hellbender. They developed a Hellbender kit. Um, and so I did a test using water extracted from our Hellbender um, head starting center here at the wilds. And so we did different dilutions to see um, what was the, the limit of detection, and then uh, also quantifying it to see is it as good as doing traditional benchtop lab qPCR. So I ran the samples the way I normally do it, and then I used um, this, this portable qPCR method. Um, and what I found, there's, there's a couple of things to unpack on this slide that I'll go through quickly, but I found that it did a pretty good job. So the top here is the benchtop, so the traditional like lab qPCR. The bottom is the portable qPCR that you know you can do out in the fields with with the equipment that they have, and I found that could detect Hellbender eDNA with both of them, and the limit of detection was about the same. So it wasn't that one was um, greatly more sensitive than the other, and they both quantified pretty well. So this is showing the different dilutions and uh, a regression line showing how well the estimated amount of eDNA followed the the known dilution, and you can see that that um, that regression line is a little bit stronger, the R squared is a little bit stronger for the bench top, but it's significantly uh, associated, correlated with both. Um, so it does suggest that you can both detect and, and quantify um, for, again, this is species specific, um, but in the field without having your own lab. Now this, as you might expect, the, um, because of the, the speed and ease of use, the extraction kit is more expensive than um, per sample um, than, uh, than doing like the the Kyogen in the lab, you know, assuming you already have the lab lab infrastructure. Um, I believe if if I'm not mistaken, it's about 20 bucks a sample for the extraction. Um, and in with a portable qPCR unit, you can only run three samples at a time compared to 96 in the lab. But if 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 lab space is an issue or you're um, wanting to be testing out a protocol, this this is definitely a good method for that. And you can go to their like go to their website for, they have some, they have a, a eDNA water samplers, some other cool stuff available. So what about PCR inhibition? Um, and maybe you haven't asked this question because you don't know what PCR inhibition is, but those who have dealt with it certainly know. Um, PCR inhibition is really any interference with the ability of your DNA to replicate that fragment in PCR. So essentially it's anything that would cause PCR to not work, even if you have the target DNA in there that should match up with your primers. And there's a whole host of ways this can happen, um, but it's really common in environmental samples that have organic substances that, that interfere with the PCR amplification of the PCR replication. And well, what are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with environmental samples. So we often have to deal with this, um, particularly like really like samples with a lot of sediment. And so I did, um, this is a joint project that I worked with Anna McKee at USGS and also um, Todd Pearson where we had sampled eDNA for coastal plain amphibians, so uh, flatwood salamanders, gopher frogs, and striped newts, uh, in wetlands that typically are you know, highly, are, are pretty acidic, have a lot of organic um, materials in there, like they're, they're very prone to inhibition. And in fact, we found that while certainly not every sample was inhibited, um, we had some level of inhibition across the board in most of, in, in all the different sites, most of the different sites, about a third of the wetlands, 
in a couple of sites, 100% of the qPCRs were inhibited. So in that case, we would get a false negative if we didn't account for this, um, because we would see nothing happens. We would assume the species isn't there. But in reality, it could be there. We're just not being able to amplify it. And there's ways to put internal controls into your PCR reaction. And you see if those internal controls don't work, which should work every single time, then you know you have inhibition. So what we did, and again, uh, just going to breeze through this, but we, we did three different methods for trying to get rid of inhibition. So we did dilution, which is a pretty common, cheap way of trying to basically dilute out the inhibitors. Um, and then there's a, a spin column that removes a lot of the inhibitors. And what we found, what this is showing is how consistent the quantification was. So we found actually that, that all three methods worked. Um, but the closer um, these, uh, these two are to, to, um, to, to zero show like how more um, the, with, on the right, the, the standard deviation lower shows more consistency. And so the column purification had more consistency from sample to sample compared to the dilution treatments, although those seem to work as well. So there are ways to remove inhibition. Now, these may not work all the time, particularly if you have really bad inhibition, but they seem to be um, mostly effective. And for sites that we, for studies that we knew had evidence of inhibition, we would just run everything through the spin column. Another common question is, okay, so I pick up eDNA. Well, how long does it persist in the environment? Like, how do I know that it's not something that's been there years ago, or, you know, or, or how recently has that been there? Um, and particularly with water, um, lots of things can degrade DNA in, in that environment. So UV light, high temperature, low pH, different enzymes can all break down DNA. And so there's been a few studies that have looked um, particularly in water, um, but I'll give a soil example too, um, to see how quickly uh, DNA degrades after the source is gone. So these are mesocosms um, with spade foot toads and newts. And where you see this big drop right here, this is when they removed those animals from the mesocosm. In this case, within a few days, uh, all traces of eDNA were gone. So it didn't last very long. Um, this is another study with bullfrogs and sturgeon. Um, a little bit less steep of a drop off than before, but you can see the access is 30 days here. So within 20 to 25 days, you're not picking them up. This is a study um, uh, by Pilly et al. With, um, in a well-researched um, uh, stream uh, salamander um, system. Uh, this uh, Idaho giant salamanders. They actually put a salamander in the in a creek that they knew didn't have any, and found that 24 hours or before in 24 hours you could pick it up pretty well. You remove the salamander, and almost immediately, this is hours down here, you lost all trace of it. Um, and then actually in the the soil study I talked about, the Kukurenko et al. Um, they with the corn snake uh, in the lab, they removed the corn snake and found at least in that system within uh, a few days, uh, within four days, the, the black dots here actually represent eDNA positives, the circles represent something else. Um, they couldn't detect the, the presence of the snake from the soil. So in general, it doesn't seem to last very long, so it's a very contemporary measure. Um, I will say even though that soil example showed that it disappeared pretty quickly, that snake was, wasn't on that soil for a super long time, and people get ancient DNA from soil. So particularly if you have a burrowing species that's producing a lot of DNA in that soil, you might have much longer detection times. And the truth is, for things like herps, we have no idea how long that is. Um, and that would definitely require um, some study if you were starting a soil eDNA study with some, some type of burrowing reptile or amphibian. OK, so only a couple more questions to get to, and then can get to your questions. So one of the million dollar questions is, well, OK, this is all great if we know they're there or not, but how do we know the population status? So can eDNA estimate abundance? This is what a lot of us would really like um, for monitoring. And the answer is, well, maybe sort of depends on the system. So in, in control, more controlled settings, so this is, this is a natural pond, but one that had been um, censused quite, um, quite extensively, we see a, a significant relationship between the density of individuals and the amount of DNA. Um, it, it follows pretty well this curve for spadefoot toads. It's still significant for newts, but as you can see, there's a lot of noise around that line. This is um, that, that Pacific Stream salamander system that I mentioned before um, by Apilia et al. So uh, Idaho giant salamanders and Rocky Mountain tail frogs. Again, positive, um, con positive significant correlations. A lot cleaner pattern with the frogs than you get with the salamanders, but still it, it, it follows um, 
density. And, and again, this is a very well studied system where they had um, confident estimates of density. Um, I've done some work with this held this, and this is just one example. Um, I found that there, I haven't found a, a really good relationship with Hellbender survey density and, and eDNA, although I fully admit that it's a lot harder to get good uh, density measures for Hellbenders because they're a lot harder to survey for. And in fact, there was a recent study um, with Hellbenders in the Northeast um, that some colleagues did where they did find at broad scales, it looked like there was a relationship between them. So it does look like in general, you can get a significant relationship between eDNA and, and density, but we're, we're not to the point where we can have a lot of confidence and saying, okay, we got this amount of eDNA, that means that's X number of, of individuals. And that's definitely something folks are still working on. Oh, um, and then if you're doing metabarcoding, uh, you might think the number of sequences, so the number of reads you get, might correlate with, um, with abundance. And this is, this is actually a study with, with fish, not with herps, um, but they found that if you just looked at the number of reads themselves, or the proportion of the, excuse me, the proportion of the eDNA that, that represents different species, um, it, you know, it didn't have a linear relationship, but if you looked at the rank to the abundance of number of reads, it did follow with the rank abundance of, of biomass. Um, so again, it suggests that perhaps the number of reads can help us at least get an approximate of abundance. And then finally, a lot of work I do is in rivers. Uh, rivers, water is moving, eDNA is going to move. So I get a lot of questions like, well, if you get a positive, what does that mean? I mean, is it right there? Is it kilometers upstream? Like how precise? Um, is, is your eDNA sample. And so there's been some work in different systems. So I'm referencing, this is the Idaho giant salamander system again. Uh, again, well-characterized distance uh, densities. So the, this background gray line represents the density of salamanders. The, the dashed black line represents eDNA amounts. And you can see that there's a little bit of a lag, but the amount of eDNA does, does follow these peaks. And there's a lag, but it's pretty short. This is in meters. Um, hundreds of meters, excuse me. So um, it's showing that here it's probably relatively precise. Of course, these are smaller systems. They aren't large rivers. Um, kind of on the other hand, this isn't a herp study, but um, it's with uh, uh, macroinvertebrates. It's a system where they have these lake macroinvertebrates and they sampled downstream where, they, where those species shouldn't be. So any pickup would be drift. And they found for, for some of these up to 15 kilometers for the Daphnia here, they were able to pick up eDNA 15 kilometers downstream. So this is an example where it looks like there is no drift. Um, this is an example with hellbenders that I've done where this is showing we get different amounts of DNA depending on the year. So we get a big pulse of DNA during the September breeding season. Um, most of the year, there's no correlation of the position in the stream and the amount of eDNA suggesting that DNA is not traveling very far. But when we had this big pulse during the breeding season in September, um, granted, these are only three points along the stream, so um, take, that, take that grain of salt. But we did see a correlation between how far down the stream and the amount of eDNA, suggesting that when you have lots of it, it probably travels pretty far down. So that's it for, for me with that before your questions. Um, obviously, I, as, whatever time we have left, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, here's my email um, that you can you can certainly um, contact me if you need, um, and, uh, and yeah, so I'll turn it over to Jen at this point. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thanks so much uh, to you, Steve. This has been super informative, and you covered tons of material, so um, I'm sure that everybody's really grateful for all the information you've provided. Um, and so we are at the top of the hour, but um, I'm going to continue asking questions and continue with the recording, and, and folks can hop off as they need to. Um, but I'll go through the list of questions that have been submitted, and if you've already adequately covered it and I missed it, um, then just, just say it's already been covered. Um, so one of the participants would like to know more about current costs to set up a multi-species invasive species monitoring and detection program for terrestrial or aquatic species. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to give an exact cost for something like that because there's so many different variables. I mean, it depends on um, what lab you're working with or, or who you're working with. As I mentioned, these multi-species require uh, or, or typically have been done with, with things like the like Illumina Next Generation sequencing platform is a common one. Um, and a single run of those can be several thousand dollars. But as I said, depending on 
how many samples you're running, if you're working in a lab that's running a lot of these where you can share uh, lane space, like it, it, can, it can really fluctuate. Um, and, and if you're, and the other thing to consider that I didn't really highlight strongly when talking about, but beyond just the cost of actually running the samples and the reagents, um, you also need to consider the cost to, to develop these. So if you're, if you're trying to identify a community of invasive species that there isn't a lot of previous work um, uh, done on and you need to maybe design primers um, and test out primers, um, you need to do some mock communities. So basically where you would take DNA of those invasive species, mix them up together in a, you know, in a lab sample and see, okay, if I run with my primers, am I going to pick up all the species? You know, test out different concentrations to see how sensitive it is. Um, so, so I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's just really hard um, to give, to give like, oh, it should cost this much. Um, so it, it depends on, on a lot of factors. And certainly if, you know, if, if that's that someone wants to wants to talk more specifically online, I'm I'm happy to, to discuss more there in the specific situation. Um, but but I guess it is important to say that there can be, particularly in, in systems that you're trying to just start in, um, the upfront cost can be you know can be kind of high. Uh, or I mean not not like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but certainly thousands or in some cases depending on exactly the scope of what you're doing, tens of thousands of dollars in in, in what labs you're working with. Um, and, and you don't want to skimp on that upfront because if you don't do the upfront work, um, right, that optimization, that that proof of concept, then you could run a lot of samples and find out down the line that you know you made a mistake up front. So um, so anyway, that that's my answer to that question. Sorry if it's not more satisfactory. No, I think it's a great answer. You've given them all the different factors they need to consider and and you know some ballpark figures. So I think that's great. Um, the next question is, do you use multiple filters? when large volumes of water are filtered, um, such as with 10 liters? And if so, how do you process those filters for DNA extraction? So I tend to not, I, myself, I don't, but I know folks that have had. Um, there's actually been studies that have um, used, used multiple filters and, and what some of them have done is actually extracted from um, each of those filters and you, you can and sometimes see like certain like uh definitely depending on your targets some targets um uh, will be picked up uh better with different pore sizes um so so particularly if you're trying to look at a community thing it may be worthwhile yeah sampling at these different pore sizes and then extracting from all of them i mean i suppose you could also extract from uh multiple filters and, and combine those samples um, if you're trying to reduce the number of samples you'd run um, but yeah, I mean, I guess th those are some some different options. I typically, for what I've I've done, most of the sampling I've done has been in rivers with a few different species. Um, my kind of default is at least what I try out first is one liter, and in most rivers, as long as they're not super silty, that seems to do reasonably well. But it, it certainly I've had to I've had to to, to ramp it down like that. Um, southeastern coastal amphibian study we. We were doing 250 mils, and and we're happy with being able to to do that. So so doing multiple filters is a good way to try and um, maybe get rid of some of that sediment, but but pick up some of the you know smaller cells or, or DNA. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, and and I think that UT means University of Tennessee, but I'm not sure. It said, has anyone tried using digital PCR? We had bio rad reps at UT last week who said it would be a good option for dirty low DNA concentration samples. Yeah, so digital droplet PCR is something that fell out in my just being general and not going to the specifics. Um, but it's definitely it's it's uh, in the class of, of quantitative PCR where you're trying to um, trying to get a, a good estimate of the absolute amount of DNA you have, and it's. It's it's a much more precise way. I haven't used it myself, but folks have, and it's definitely a much more precise way of quantifying DNA um, uh, because it, it's running basically each one's like a different PCR reaction instead of one one larger one. Uh, I don't know about um, about it with inhibition um, one way or the other. It's not not anything that I I know anyone has specifically worked with or seen, but uh, I have. You know, if if the rep said that there's evidence to suggest that it does well with inhibited samples, I have nothing to say that it doesn't. I just, yeah, just don't know. Okay. Um, then someone said, I am aware that this is mostly focused on freshwater habitats, 
but do you have any suggestions for the maximum amount of water to filter for marine environments? Um, I, I'm, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm just, there's, there's, there's a number of papers with marine systems. I don't know if there's been anything herp-wise, like for sea turtles or whatever, but certainly for, for fish and um, in, 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 in other uh, marine organisms, there's been a number of papers. Um, because I, I have, haven't done marine stuff myself, I've, I haven't paid as much to the, the details of what they've done. So I, don't, I actually don't know off the top of my head how much water they filtered. Um, but certainly I can pass on those references or, or, or look it up later um, and see. But there's definitely um, work that's been done in the marine environment that could, could, could guide that. Okay. Um... And I don't know if you answered this one yet or not, but it says, how long can filters be stored in 95% ethanol, and will they start to break down? Uh, I mean, they could, in theory, they could be stored indefinitely, um, you know, especially if, you, obviously, you make sure the tube is tight, things aren't evaporating, or you store it, you know, you put it into a into a good freezer afterwards. I mean, it should um, it shouldn't break down at all. Um, as far as like, if you're talking about breakdown, like physical breakdown of the filter, um, the filters I use, so some people have talked to me on how the, the filters were actually dissolved in the, um, in, in their storage. I've, I've actually, with the ones I use, that doesn't tend to happen, but even if it does, like it's still, still all within that tube. So as long as you have the appropriate preservative and, and ethanol is not the only thing. Um, there's other ways, like there's, there's a, uh, buffer called CTAB buffer that a lot of folks use. So. Um, so I'm not trying to, to suggest that that's the only way to do it, but uh, it should it should last for a long time, certainly within the scope of when you'd probably probably do a study. So so it really is good opportunities if you're out there in the field and you think you might want to um, look at uh, eDNA for either species or community down the line, but you don't have the funding yet, but you're out in the field then, um, and you can at least like either collect water or filter it, then by all means do that because you can store these samples. And even if you're looking at a target species now and think, you know, five years down the road, you know, you've archived your, your DNA in a freezer that you use to say, look at bullfrogs and you realize, hey, there's, you know, this disease that's emerging. And I wonder if it was at my site five years ago, um, you know, you can go back and test that. Um, so, yeah, you definitely want to archive, archive these things in good freezers and you can come back to them later. Okay. Um, and then the next, there are several similar questions, but I think that they've been answered. Um, another question is, do you have examples of collection protocols and lab protocols that incorporate your recommended QA, QC measures that you can share with us through email after the webinar? Um, I know you have that paper. Is it okay with me for me to share that with the group after this webinar? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And there are, there are good protocols that I, 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 I didn't put together myself, but colleagues have. Um, Particularly through USGS, and, and um, that I can I can pass on those those protocols both for collecting eDNA and, and QAQC. Um, another good and you have the critical considerations paper I think that you, you can pass on. That's a that's a good review of, of some of the things thinking about um, designing a study and quality assurance and that sort of thing. So yeah, there are there are definitely good resources. Fish and Wildlife Service is another one, particularly for their um, carp eDNA sampling. They they have a protocol there, so I can I can pass on some of that. Okay, great. Um, do you have thoughts on ethanol versus Longmire's buffer for filter storage? Uh, I've never used Longmire's buffer myself. Um, ethanol, ethanol has worked well for me, but I mean, really, anything, anything that is going to preserve that can preserve DNA um, and is stable over, uh, you know, that is, that's stable, I guess, um, it should be fine. So there's there's a I mean, there's a whole host of potential um, preservatives that could be used. I'm certainly not endorsing one or the other um, uh, method, but I've, I've used ethanol. It's worked well for me, so I've continued to use ethanol. Okay. Um, one of the webinar participants said that Longmire buffer works well for long-term storage at room temperature, um, so thanks for sharing that. The next question is, I've heard that people use silica beads to dry out their samples to preserve until they can get it back to the lab. Is that not adequate enough? Is ethanol required? Um, yeah, people definitely use, uh, definitely use silica beads for, um, for a number of things. I don't, I, I mean, I 
could be wrong. I don't I don't remember anyone. I don't know of anyone directly that that's used for filters. But off the top of my head, I can't think of a good reason why that wouldn't work. We use it for all sorts of other um, like other tissue samples and things like that. So um, I don't want to I don't want to give a definitive yes or no on that because someone may point out like an, an obvious reason why that could be problematic. But at least conceptually to me, that that seems like that should be fine. Um, and, and it's it's quite possible folks have done it. So I don't know if anyone <laughs> is on the call still that, that's worked with it and can chime in. I can look into that. Um, but it, it seems like that that it could work okay. Okay. Um, and then we had a, a request to list the primary labs that you would recommend for an organization that's not equipped to do the analysis and that would only be involved in the sample collections and interested in the results. Um, I'm going to compile that uh, a list of labs Sean and share that with the group so I can get that to you. Um, I won't be able to do it within the next couple of weeks, but it will definitely be coming down the pike and I can uh, I will share it with everybody on this um, who registered for the webinar. Um, let's see. And then here's a question. It says, what does a well refer to in eDNA analysis for um, it says you referenced it in number of positive brook trout wells. OK, um, yeah, a well is just it's just what we call like on your plate you have um, you have the space where you put the samples we call them a well so a well basically would in 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 a context to say like a PCR would would be like one sample or one sorry one replicate of one sample so if we were running something in triplicates or running three replicates for a single sample that would take up three wells okay um, another question is how do you calculate the LOD um, the, so LOD is limited detection. So basically, um, you you quantify based on a standard curve um, the amount of DNA, and you see well, you see it, what's the lowest amount of DNA that you can reliably amplify. So the limited detection is if the concentration is below that, um, you might not be able to to amplify it with with your protocol. And there's also a, a kind of a, a complementary um, called limit of quantification. And so there's there's cases with qPCR where you can pick up presence absence, but you can't consistently quantify it because it's just too variable because it's too low concentration. And so that that's that could be a separate limit where you can reliably quantify it. But limited detection is just how um, how low of a concentration of DNA can you can you reliably detect? Okay. Um... And can you use eDNA surveys for um, hybrid species? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, if you you can, as long as you can um, develop uh, developing primers that that are specific to that that hybrid um, hybrid species. Yeah, yeah, you you definitely can. It just you know it's just uh, the optimization and making sure that um, your protocol will will uh, amplify that target. But uh, um, but yeah, there's there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, and I think, if I recall, I think there actually is a a, a paper out that um, that did look at at, at hybridization, uh, detecting hybridization with eDNA. Although right now I'm blanking on the details of it, but I could okay. I could look it up and find it. Okay. Um, and then even if you answered this question, if you wouldn't mind answering it again. Um, See. With heavily sedimented water, do you need to collect more or less water? That's a that's a really good question, um, and I I don't have like a definitive, confident answer to that. Um, and, and I think it it might depend. I mean, one thing that I've wondered is if having having more sediment in the water, you might actually have a higher detection per per unit filtered because you might have uh, cells or things that, that bind more in that sediment or you know if the sediments flushed up from the bottom and you have DNA that settled down there and been kind of preserved in there if you have a higher chance of detecting it with more sediment um, but at the same hand obviously more sediment it's hard to filter more water um, and and so it it, it may decrease things um, so I, I don't I don't have a a yes or no definitive always this way, um, but but yeah, I, I think it, I think it could go either way. But it, it's very possible that um, having having a lot of sediment could could increase your ability to to detect the DNA if it's there because it's it's potentially binding to it. I don't know if there's really been 
I don't think there's been a lot of work looking at that directly. I mean, the closest I can think of off the top of my head is I mentioned that CARP study where they where they picked up DNA in the sediment of the rivers. They were also taking um, water samples from that same area and comparing them, and they found more DNA down in the sediment of the CARP, even though obviously the CARP are most of the time in, in the water column, which would suggest that DNA was was settling down and, and being preserved at least to some degree down down the sediment. So if you have a system where um, you know, a lot of that, that sediment is coming like, or a lot of that uh, turbidity is coming from the bottom of the sediment being kicked up, then that might increase it. Now, if you have a situation where, where, you know, you just sampled after a high rain event and most of that sediment is coming off the land, then it may be the opposite. Um, so it's, I, I try as a rule to, particularly if I'm dealing with systems that aren't typically um, high in sediment, uh, I, I tend to, for instance, not sample when there's been high rains or, the water's high because that's going to potentially do things or it's really really mucky obviously if you have a system that's always um high in sediment there's not much you can do about that but i try and avoid it if i can okay um is there an ideal depth to from which to collect the samples uh it depends on your study system but i can tell you sampling for for, for hellbenders which are species that lives on the bottom of rivers that I've I've collected more. I, I tend to I tend to get it for that species. Get it from where it's flowing, not from a, like a stagnant pool. Um, but just off the side of the the creek side, where the water is relatively shallow, um, and I I can pick them up. So, it, but it really depends on on what you're looking at, like how the water is flowing, um, uh, for what for what's ideal. Um, there's no one size fits all for something like that. Okay. Um, do you know of any work done with skinks, specifically the Florida sand skink? Uh, I am not aware. That certainly seems like one that would would be a natural to at least test for soil, but and there certainly could be folks working on it, but I'm not aware of any published study for eDNA with sand skinks or or directly of anyone working on it right now. Okay. Um, are there general sampling protocols on where to sample? And so more specifically, are there biases associated with sampling the shoreline versus the surface water versus the center of a pond, lake, or stream? Um, it, it, again, it, it depends. Um, I've done, for instance, with, with river sampling um, for hellbenders, which is what I've done the, the majority of my DNA work with, there's been a, a few times where we've sampled it like across a river or different points within the same area. And in general, for that system, it doesn't seem to matter a whole lot. Like the, I mean, the water's flowing. I think the, the DNA or, or cells are all mixing um, for the most part. Now, if you're, if you're sampling, say, like a, a lentic environment and you're sampling a breeding pond, um, you know, say for some ambistema or whatever, and uh, there's a part of the site where there's emergent veg and that's where all, that's where they're breeding and that's where the tadpoles are, and you sample on the other side of the pond and it's big enough, then yeah, that could make a huge difference. Um, so you definitely, I mean, as much as possible, you want to you wanna target where you think within that, that site you're likely to have um, those species. And in some, some systems, you may be able to be more you know, lenient or liberal with that. And in some systems, you may have to be really close. Uh, like I said, those, those pond systems, particularly for if you're dealing with uh, low density species, like say something like flatwood salamanders, if you sample all throughout the pond, you'll probably notice that you're not getting ubiquitous detection. So in that sense, it really does, it does matter, um, but it may not in every single case. Okay. And what is the best way to achieve adequate spatial replicates? I, I would say, I guess a pilot study. Um, it, it really, I think it depends a lot on your detection. So detection is not, I mean, I gave some examples where it was pretty high, uh, but I've also done some some mud puppy DNA, and compared to hellbenders, I actually run them in multiplex. Detection appears to be uh, a lot lower for mud puppies than hellbenders. Um, so, so for instance, when we're doing kind of a a broad survey, just trying to pick up hellbender detections, and we're not focusing on any one site, a lot of times we'll just take one per site because I found that that typically <laughs> all I need to detect them if they're there. Um, but if I'm really trying to focus on identifying whether a site is mud puppy positive, I'm probably going to want to take a lot more than that. Um, so it, it's really system dependent. And the only way you know that is either by previous work or doing your own pilot study. 
So I would, when you're starting out a new system, I would encourage taking multiple replicates at a site. I mean, a, a, a common is taking three replicates, but sometimes you you may want more than that, depending on you know uh, how confident you are in, in being able to detect the species. And then you kind of figure from there. Okay, you know, is, can I cut down the number of samples based on my detection rate? Okay, sounds good. Um, so the next question is, you talked about the parameters that, that would affect how long the DNA stays in the water. Could you expand a little bit more about them? Um, for example, pH, temperatures, et cetera, and how those affect the longevity of the DNA in the water. Yeah, so, so in general, and there's been, there's been some work, um, uh, some studies that have looked directly at this, but in general, the higher the temperature, the, the more quickly DNA is going to degrade. So colder water, it should last longer. Um, pH, uh, more acidic pH uh, will will degrade DNA faster. Um, so that that's that's a concern as well. Um, now there hasn't with diff these sorts of different environments. It's not to say that say a shallow, higher temperature, low pH site doesn't mean that you can't get DNA from it. In fact, with the, the coastal plain work we've done, those sites are pretty acidic and usually, or a lot of times, not particularly deep and higher temperature, and, and we've been able to pick it up. But it's just going to degrade a lot quicker. And I mean, I couldn't tell you how quickly because we haven't done that work in that system. Um, and with the studies that have, I forget off the top of my head how how it, how quickly it changed. Um, so you can you can detect them, but it is going to um, it is going to degrade quicker. And so it may reduce your detection probability um, with with those things. And, and um, you know, a higher uh, UV degrade DNA. So you know, if you're so if you're sampling on a global level and you're or maybe even elevational, I imagine higher elevation with more UV, you might have a you know a lower amount of or, or a quicker time for DNA to degrade. Um, so those are those are some of the common things I guess that we can more easily measure and maybe control for. Um, that, that have an effect on, on DNA. But just because you have those factors doesn't mean that you can't get eDNA. It just means it's, it's probably going to degrade faster. Okay. Um, do you have a, any recommendations on how to estimate statistical power for designing sampling protocols, um, specifically for mapping amphibian distribution in a watershed? I mean, so the question is like how to, like for like doing like a power analysis or something like that? Yeah, how, how would you estimate statistical power? Like any recommendations for that for designing? Standards? Well, I mean, I think probably a, a relatively straightforward way would, as I mentioned, doing like a pilot study, particularly in, in, in an area where you knew had your species of interest. Um, and then, I mean, the easiest, I guess, easy in the sense of like statistically, I mean, may not be easy with with the field stuff, but but taking um, but sampling, you know, sampling a few well-known areas. Uh, as well as some areas where maybe you're pretty sure they're not, and and using like an occupancy modeling framework to to estimate detection probability, um, and and use that to guide, uh, you know what what your power is and how how detectable it is. I mean that that would be the um, I think the best way to do that. Okay. Um, and so we have a bit of information provided by one of the participants. It says drying filter samples with silica beads can preserve eDNA as well as ethanol. However, as always, care must be taken to avoid contamination. Um, so thanks, Catherine, for that helpful tip. Um, we have a request from Bonnie Free, Steve. It says resources on species that have existing species-specific primers would also be useful. Um, so if we can share that. Um, we have a request for you to point out the difficulties, um, it says, with bioinformatics, and it says that collecting eDNA is easy in comparison. That's yeah, so that's a good point. Like I said, there's a lot I glossed over um, just for trying to fit in a lot into this. But what, what they're referring to the bioinformatics is for the, for the metabarcoding, so for the multi-species. Um, I probably made it seem a lot easier than it actually is, but if you, particularly if you're working in a new system, the you act, so a you have to have a reference database of all the species that you're interested in because you need to know if those sequences match up to it. But there's also a lot of um, computationally intensive work to even identify those sequences. So it's not something that um, you know that that without if you've if you've never done it before, not working with someone who has, 
there's definitely a big learning curve and, and that that would be a whole another webinar in itself but thank you for pointing that out um I, I probably made it seem a lot more straightforward easier than this that being said you know i anyone could do it if they're they're willing to learn or they're working with someone that does but it, it there are a lot of factors that i didn't talk about okay um, and an, another helpful tip from Catherine is that the eDNA group at Washington State University has put together a website that hosts a variety of eDNA resources, including protocols, and she provided that um, website. And so um, I will share that with the group as well, Catherine, so thanks for, for sending that, and I'll, I'll send it out whenever the recording comes available. But um, Catherine says that any contributions of additional resources are always appreciated. Um, so Steve, if you have anything you want to add to that site, it sounds like they'd be, um, you know, they'd be very receptive to that. Um, another question is, can you combine your spatial replicates together if you are sampling one body, one water body source? So you only use one filter? Um, sure. Yeah, you could if if you're if um, if you're not interested in where they are in there, um, and you're just trying to to get a detection site. Absolutely, you can. Um, I mean, if you're doing something where you're combining equal amount equal amount of water from different places, and let's say you're taking just hypothetically from 10 different areas and only one of them have your species of interest and there's not tons of them, then you may worry about if you're combining water, diluting your, your DNA that you sampled. But um, but there's there's no problem if all you care about is detection of the site um, combining. And I, I've done that to some degree for some. You just want to make sure you don't um, reduce your chance of, of detecting true positives. Okay. Um, and then the last question I can answer, it says, can we get the PowerPoint uh, for this webinar at a later date? Um, well, actually, I, I was going to say that the recording will be available at a later date, but it um, sounds like she's asking specifically for the slides. And I don't, I don't think you have notes associated with your slides. Is that right, Steve? But, but um, I guess that's up to you, Steve, if you wanted to make your PowerPoint available to others. Um, Possibly, probably. Let me. I so it might have noticed those on the bottom. A couple of slides I um, used that that were put together by collaborators. I just wanted we want to check with them to make sure that that they were fine with it um, before before sending it out. But but probably. But let me let me let me check first. Okay. Um, and 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 yeah. So the recording will be available. Um, and as as well as um, the other information I said that I'd provide um, again a list of laboratories where people can send samples that will that will come in several weeks so it won't be sent out with the initial recording recording and then I'll also include um, that site that Catherine uh, recommended as well so thanks so much Steve this has been a fantastic webinar um, we have you know well over 200 for participants, lots of great questions. Um, so, so there's definitely a lot of interest in this topic and um, people were definitely pleased with it. And, and Catherine sent a little note, thanks for a really informative webinar. It's a great summary of eDNA methods and considerations and some other thank yous are coming in as well. So thanks again, Steve. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Yeah, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, this was great to do. Sure thing. Bye.